Welcome to another edition of the Litigation Psychology Podcast. I am Dr. Bill Kanaski. This, as you know, is brought to you by Courtroom Sciences. Visit www.courtroomsciences for all your litigation support needs. Yes, buy that mock trial, buy that focus group, prep your witness appropriately. And this guy I have with me, he knows a little something about witness prep because he's an attorney, but he's got a very, very interesting story. And I went out and I found this guy. And I said, I need this guy on the show because this guy has very important information that's never been discussed on this podcast before. Mr. Brian Thompson, Law in Motion. Brian, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, Bill. I really appreciate you having me on today. Oh, this is going to be fascinating because uh, little, little do people know, a couple people do know this. I double majored in exercise science at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And then when I got my PhD in uh, clinical psychology, it was in behavioral medicine. And I largely focused on um, diet behavior, exercise behavior. So you and I have some uh, interesting uh, uh, backgrounds here. You're an attorney. And you, I, I looked up, I looked at your website and looking at it right now, and you're focusing on getting attorneys fit and in shape. Tell me about your journey, where you started and, and how it got here, because I find this fascinating. Sure. Um, well, yeah, I've been a practicing attorney for about uh, 14 years now. And right around the time that I uh, was studying for the bar exam, you know, we all kind of know what a time suck that is. <laughs> um, I uh, coincidentally during that, uh, those few months sprained my knee, uh, just kind of playing some recreational soccer. Yep. Um, and so between being um, uh, wrapped up in a knee brace and spending all my hours uh, with uh, the books open, I put on a little extra fluff um and this was right around i uh, right around age 30 and uh, up until then i'd always kind of had some vague ambitions about getting in shape well one day when i get in really good shape mm -hmm. um and so after that bar experience and after the knee healed and after i sort of assessed uh you know that my new uh, age bracket here um <laughs> i said you know well brian when is this going to happen um, you know, when, uh, you know, when is this just gonna, um, uh, when are you going to be more affirmative or proactive about this? Uh, and so then and there, I decided I was going to make a lifestyle change. Uh, I was going to start uh, going to the gym more, uh, eating better. Um, and I realized that it wasn't just sort of a short-term fix or a short-term goal to just have say six pack abs or something like that. I wanted to do a life overhaul. Um, and I wanted to do it while, um, also being involved and committed to my new profession. So I wanted to, uh, you know, show myself that, that you can have both, uh, both be a practicing attorney and prioritize uh, health and fitness. That's, that's really an unbelievable story. Uh, well, congratulations, number one, because you, you look like you're in great shape. I have to tell you, I've been working uh, uh, in litigation for this is I'm going on my 18th year. Um, I'm going to tell you something that you already know. Two things. Number one, particularly in litigation, trial attorneys, uh, this is a very, very stressful area of law. Maybe the most stressful. Number one, maybe maybe divorce attorney, maybe number one, but it's at least tied. Right. So number one. Right. Uh, very, very stressful. Number two, many folks relying on the billable hour for their income, which really talk about a, a time suck. Can you talk about the just inherent challenges for the attorney that exist that really, I mean, the cards are kind of stacked against the, 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 the litigator, the trial attorney, because of the intense amount of time towards the job. I think in many cases that sets them up for disaster. And then by the time they figure out, and you had that kind of come to Jesus moment of, Hey, I need to change. Sometimes when that happens, they're so far down the road, they don't feel like they can do it. Talk just a little bit about the attorney setup and how it's really built against, against really being in shape and being healthy. Yeah. Well, you know, Bill, you nailed it when you referenced a lack of time, right? Time is the one thing um, that we can't manufacture more of. And it seems like there's this pressure, especially on litigators to, uh, if you have any extra time during your day, bill more hours, be more productive. And we sort of glorify overworking um, yeah. in our culture. And of course, that's maybe a larger philosophical dis uh, discussion in and of itself. But 
you know, if you ask busy professionals, attorneys, and, and particularly litigators, what is your biggest obstacle to exercising more, eating better, et cetera, they'll say time. It's just a lack of time. Not only uh, the jobs of the, uh, the demands of the job, but also, you know, you get home, if you have a family, if you have a significant other, um, you know, those place extra demands on your time. And pretty yeah. soon you tally up all the hours that you have to allocate to these um, priorities in your life. And, you know, when do we have time to, to work out, to take care of ourselves, right? And so, yeah. um, you know, it's, and it's not just the lack of time too, but there's also the work environment uh, that attorneys find themselves in. You know, we're chained to our desk most of the time. We have electronic devices that we just interact in terrible oh, yeah. uh, positions with. Um, we're often at that desk. We're often sitting. We are, we, if we drive a car, we sit while we commute. Um, we just assume these poor postural positions for long periods, um, you know, and that leads to not only um, some obvious orthopedic problems, but also uh, other chronic health issues, obesity, diabetes, etc. So there is really this um, toxic setup that yeah. uh, attorneys and litigators have to confront uh, if they want to um, even put in the kind of the basic maintenance uh, that their, their bodies require. Yeah, that is really important. And let's, I want to focus on some of this posture. Okay. So for 18 years, I've been bouncing around from city to city, always on the move. Right. And I, I never sat at a desk ever. And then COVID hit. And then every, I mean, and, and by the way, zoom, I'm going to tell you, I'm sending the CEO of zoom a Christmas card right? Maybe a fruit basket during the holidays to say thank you for saving my career, because otherwise it would have been put on hold for a year. So we figured out, hey, we could do a lot of our work, our meetings, our witness prep, hell, even some focus groups via Zoom. So for the first time in my life, I sat in this chair, the same one I'm talking to you in, pretty much five days a week for six to 10 hours a day. Brian, after, after two months of this, I woke up one morning, I looked at my, I said, I can't move. I can't get out of bed. She took me to my doctor. He's like, did you get into a car crash? I go, no. <laughs> I go, I go, I can't move. I, go, I feel, I feel like I've been hit by a, a truck. I feel like complete dog shit. And he said, he checked me out and he's like, well, what have you been doing? I go, I've been working on zoom all day. And he goes at the desk. I go, yeah. And he goes, I think I know your problem. <laughs> I mean, it really, while it helped me with my career for the first time ever, like you said, very forward posture. So I started to become kyphotic. Everything was in front of me, right? I had a decent office chair, but the sitting, the sitting, the sitting, all these aches and pains. And so what my, um, uh, what my wife did was she went out and got me a standing desk. The standing desk, I think could be the greatest invention. And so what I do now I'll do my podcast from here. And then over there, I have a standing desk. It's on wheels. I can wheel it around the room. I can put it in front of a monitor and watch the news while I work. Talk to me about how this is really, really a good idea. I've seen it catching on in corporate America, but just standing all day makes a huge impact on your posture and on your physical health, right? Absolutely. Um, you know, lack of movement is kind of the real enemy. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, as you've kind of described, this sedentary um, office environment or our sedentary lifestyles are really sort of a, um, a silent enemy here. They're not, uh, they don't obviously lead to some of these problems the way like if you uh, fell on your bike or if you were in a car accident, it's easy to link these single discrete traumatic events to uh you know pain that we might be feeling yeah. but you know if, if our only problem is just you know sitting all day or, or adopting poor postures they can kind of sneak up on us because our bodies are really resilient machines they all these redundant systems built into them so that we can um even uh, you know experience pain or injury and still accomplish the tasks that uh, we need our bodies to accomplish. So adopting poor postures, like sitting, for example, the way you described for those few months, um, that can work until one day it doesn't, yeah. right? And yeah. that's kind of what you experience is that all of a sudden, 
you know, this nagging, this nagging pain starts to kind of creep up on us. And the cause isn't always obvious until someone clues us into, well, what have you been doing all day? Well, I've, I've, I've changed my routine and I'm sitting a lot now. Ah, there we go. Right. So we've kind of spotted the culprit. So, you know, these, um, you know, posture is kind of really the, the key um, concept, I think, to think about. Um, and I, was, I would suggest think of the word posture as just another word for position, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there's, there's two types of, of, of posture. There's static and dynamic posture. And so, you know, what in the world is that? St static, you know, as, as its name implies, that's, that's you know, our, our body's alignment and our, and our joint position while we're sitting still. Dynamic is our alignment during movement and in including those movement patterns themselves. And not only those movement patterns, but the muscles we recruit to accomplish those tasks. Um, and then if we find ourselves um, sitting uh, or in otherwise adopting poor positions for long periods of time, we start to develop uh, muscle imbalances um, and then compensations to, as kind of workarounds. Yeah. Uh, and again, those will work for a while until one day they don't. Um, and they start to lead to dysfunction and pain. So that kind of defines the, um, like the, the conceptually, um, the problem and, and, and what, um, you know, what we're facing in terms of the causes of, of chronic pain for, um, for sedentary individuals. Yeah. Now I'm going to, we're going to end the podcast later with talking about how to, how to form a plan. Yes. Cause this has to be attacked from a comfort cause you got the time issue you got the uh, settings issue, the environmental you know, issues. Now we're gonna we're gonna work up to that, but let's kind of cover a, another couple of bases. So, again, little do people know, I did my dissertation on the factors of why people quit exercise programs. Now, when I brought this in front of my committee at the University of Florida, like, now wait a second, like you, no, no, you want to study how to get people to exercise. And I said, no, I go, everybody, I go on January 2nd, everybody exercise. I go, getting somebody to exercise is not the problem in this country. It's getting people to stop quitting. We have a bunch of quitters in this society. Hate to tell you, that's what they are. They're quitters, right? And I want to figure out why are people starting on January 2nd, but then by mid-February, they've quit their New Year's resolution. What's going on? The two predictive factors that were out of this world, and they kind of correlate. There's a little interaction effect. Number one, pain. Meaning these people jumped right into the pool in the deep end. They didn't start in the kiddie shallow end and work themselves up to the deep end. They went on, they probably got some bodybuilding website or some other website, like you got to do this and six days a week. And they jumped in. And I think they got in way over their heads early. They never, their bodies were never really able to adapt. They went to, uh, well, let's say around, Orange Theory wasn't around in uh, 19, uh, uh, you know, or uh, 2003, but probably went to some gym or hired a trainer who just worked their ass off, right? And then they came home and then every day they wake up like, oh my God, this hurts. I can't move. And it was a very, it was almost punishment for exercising. That was the top predictor of why people were quitting. Number two, which I think is a really fascinating psychological part, illogical and unmet expectations. They would go work out for six weeks, hop on the scale, like, oh my, I only lost two pounds? Oh, well, well this sucks. So knowing those two things that I found in my research, so if an attorney, and many, a lot of attorneys really don't have a big exercise background or physical activity background if i'm an attorney and i come to you brian i say hey listen i want to get healthy you know um i don't have a lot of i don't know where to start can you help me how do you kind of get somebody started on the right on the right plan so they're not going to hurt themselves either physically or psychologically and then number two to educate them on expectations because here's the pro the other problem with our society it's a instant gratification right everything's fast 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 you don't everything's easy street one two three easy street how do you set up your clients for both physical and mental success 
Great questions. Um, so I think to the first point, you always want to meet somebody where they're at in terms of their current fitness level, but also their, you know, the motivation, the time they have, the interest, uh, the, their particular fitness discipline or modality and the interest they have in that. One of the first questions I would always ask a client is, um, you know, have you worked with a trainer before? And if you did, what did you like about that experience? And what did you not like about that experience? And that question, I'm trying to elicit, um, you know, what sort of style uh, motivates you? What sorts of exercise modalities? Maybe it was, um, uh, you know, weightlifting or uh, say boxing or something. What, uh, what particular fitness modality did you find the most motivating? Because it's almost a cliche in the fitness world. The best workout is the one that you do. Yeah. Right. So yeah, you're right. Less, it's less important, you know, how much weight you're lifting or a particular exercise that you're doing. What is going to motivate you to get to the gym and actually complete your workout routine? Um, so to the second point about managing expectations, I always imagine I have never driven a cargo container ship in my life, but I am what I think what the, the strategy is, is a little adjustment in direction over time is going to get you to a very different place, but you have to learn to love the process mm -hmm. and you have to be patient, right? Um, Sticking with the vehicle analogy, if you're driving your car down the highway and you want rapid change and you just flip the wheel over as hard as you can, chances are you're going to flip the car over and it's going to be a disaster. Well, the same thing kind of happens if you try to make a radical change in um, your fitness routine and you try to overhaul your life in order to get that immediacy those uh, immediate results, you're just going to flip the car and it's going to be a disaster and you won't stick with it. You'll probably get injured. Um, so it's learning to love the process um, and it's just trusting the process as well because sustainability is the key to any health and fitness routine, right? Anything that you don't, that you aren't able to sustain across a long period of time um, is just not going to be successful. Yeah, because if you don't like if you don't like what you're doing, you're not gonna keep doing. It. For example, I don't run. I hate yeah. it. it I, I, I get epically bored. I, I cannot stand it. I would rather get a steak knife and just repeatedly stab myself in the face because run. It's just boring. I can't stand it. I stand it. Number one, and a I have a lot of football injuries, so it makes it just it causes a lot of unnecessary pain. So I decide for a lot of the cardio I like to do, I like to box. I like to walk. I like to get a treadmill and put it on the incline and walk and put my headset in. I'm good with that. So I think, I think you're right. Finding something that fits your needs. Cause remember calories burn is calories burn. Whether you're walking, you're running, you're jogging, uh, you're doing yoga. There's so many things out there. And I think it's important for people to, 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 to find something they have fun with. And by the way, the other thing I hate doing, there's two things I hate doing. I hate running. I hate working out with somebody else. <laughs> I like my alone time. Get away oh. from me. I like to be alone, but I think there's a lot of social benefits to exercise where you can meet with a group and get social support if you like to get together with the guys and lift weights or if uh, other folks uh, want to get into that, you know, 30 minute yoga class or the, the 30 minute uh, Zumba, whatever. I think it's important to meet everybody's needs on that thing uh, so that they really like what they're doing. Now, let's get to something very controversial, which has been controversial. And again, this is why I, I kind of left the fitness and health industry to go into litigation for a number of reasons, but this is what made me really, really upset. So right around the year 2000, I had sent you this link. The University of Florida got awarded a huge NIH grant to study the um, interaction between exercise and weight loss. And um, we, uh, so I worked on this and it's part of what, that's where I, I got my dissertation data from. And we cracked the code. I mean, we were, and this is with walk. The only thing we do is have people walk different intensities and different frequencies, right? To see what was working really what, and everything was even different age groups. It was a huge sample as well over 500 people and every group made progress. Every group made progress, Brian. And we're talking, we're, we're working with the cardiology program, nutritionalist, you name it. We had blood pressure coming down, resting heart rate, 
coming down, cholesterol coming down, you name it, every single category of wellness and fitness and health, the bad stuff came down, the good stuff went up, right? LDL cholesterol through the roof, everything. We cracked the code, we published the results. Crickets, that's all. Here's, here's what you heard after the results. Chirp, chirp, chirp. Meanwhile, I turn on my TV and I've got uh, Denise, what's her name, telling me, hey, you know, spend a hundred bucks on this or somebody trying to sell me this. And what I figured out was like, oh my gosh, society doesn't like these answers, <laughs> which is really science, right? They, they want the quick fix, but let's yeah. get to the controversial part of weight loss. One of the main findings that we already kind of knew was going to happen, but was highly disappointing to our subjects. They so you, you give them this printout. Hey, here's your blood pressure, your heart rate, your, 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 your LDL, your HDL. And you show them all this like, wow, look at, I know what they were like. They were like, okay. We're like, no, this is like, this is going to make you live 10 years longer. And their response was, ah. And we're like, okay, well, well time out. What, what the hell is wrong with you? And they're like, well, I kind of expected to lose more weight. Oh. And what they fail to understand, which the society still does not get this. If you want to lose weight, okay, it's largely an eating behavior. It's not an exercise issue. So what I try to explain to people, my wife did the same thing. She's like, I've been doing all this stuff and I'm not losing weight. And I said, well, you can work out balls to the wall for 30 straight minutes. And guess what? You're going to like, you're going to burn 150 to 250 calories, which by the way, is like a bottle of Mountain Dew. Okay. In other words, the body's not designed to expend large amounts of energy to decrease weight. This is from an evolutionary cycle, right? We're designed to keep weight on to protect ourselves. Okay. It's not rapid weight losses are not good for the body. And so what a lot of people don't understand is that exercise plays a role, but it's, it's largely eating, be no pun intended, it's largely eating behavior that's going to um, make a huge difference there. How do you talk to your clients, your attorney clients that have these expectations when they want to lose weight? Because I imagine you get, a, you get a lot of weight loss calls, right? And they want some magic pill. How do you balance their expectations and then educate them on the balance between, yes, exercise is going to be important, but you need to make some changes in the kitchen as well? Yeah, you know, Bill, the, the golden rule, and you alluded to it, is you can't out-exercise a bad yeah. diet. You can't right? do it. So, yeah. So if you want to really overhaul your commitment to health and fitness, it can't just be done dedicating an extra hour of your day in the gym. You've really got to uh, revamp um, a lot of your daily habits. Uh, and if uh, weight loss is your goal, the biggest focus has got to be on uh, your food choices, both in quality and in quantity. Um, and it's, you know, it's just about um, committing to making, uh, you know, I'd say better food choices. Uh, I'd say about 80, I follow the 80, 20 rule myself. Um, and that's kind of the, the, the suggestion I impart on clients is that 80% of the time choose uh, clean quality, whole less zero to less to no processed foods. Uh, and then 20% of the time, you know, allow yourself to um, have in reasonable portions, um, you know, the foods that you do most enjoy. Um, and in that within that the scope of that 20%, one of my favorite sayings is make a better bad decision. <laughs> what do I mean by that? Right? Is that if you're going to, if if you're if you're committed to having, uh, so you're out at a restaurant, you're committed to having dessert that night, rather than the fifteen hundred calorie lava cake, yeah. maybe choose the <laughs> sorbet. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So you know, we start to you know just or if um, if you are going to have the lava cake, I'm only going to eat you know a, a half of it or a third of it. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's that if you're going to take the quote unquote bad decision, right, if find a way to improve it so that it is less detrimental to, uh, you know, the, the, the diet plan that you're working with. Yeah, it's uh, it's a uh, it's a significant problem. And I think we've seen some changes, 
you know, restaurant menus generally now give you the calories. It's the calories are printed out like right next to the, and yeah, you know, if you just know how to do math, I think that there's some, there's some really good things that you can do. Cause it is all math. It's, you know, it's, 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 it's input versus output. And over time it is going to happen. What, what are your thoughts? Um, and again, this is where I think things get dangerous and there's a lot of expectation letdowns and people quit. I don't like quitters, by the way, Brian, they make me nuts, but people jump on these fad diets. What has been your, like, for example, the keto diet is very, is very popular. I actually did that for some time. I felt fantastic and that I didn't need to, like, I didn't need to lose weight. I'm in great shape, but I, I just heard the, just the physical and mental, you know, results of that, meaning really getting your carbs low, more higher protein that really, I really liked that. And now I, I still kind of keep it more on the protein and, and less the carbs, probably not in ketosis, but what are kind of the pros and cons of these diets that come out? Cause everybody starts ranting and raving, everybody gets excited. And then you hear you're, you're all, all my neighbors doing the South beach diet. Oh, this neighbor's doing keto. How do you deal with that in your practice? Because a lot of this stuff is just bullshit, right? I mean, well, yeah. So, so I, I always preface this with, I'm not a dietitian. Um, so with that caveat sort of laid out in front of us, um, I always, so I live, I live in Silicon Valley, which is always looking for the next biohack. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, and you know, it's the traditional methods of calories in calories out is always going to be your base formula right? Any fad diet that gets away from that or tells you, you don't have to uh, factor that basic formula in as the foundational content of weight loss, um, I think is just bunk, right? Yeah. Um, the simple uh, tried and true of eating uh, fewer processed foods in smaller quantities, um, upping your activity level, that is the formula that will be here, has been here before all the fad diets uh, and will be here long after because at bottom, it is the most effective formula. Absolutely. My grandmother, my grandmother lived to 96 years old and never, never exercised a day in her life. But you know what she did? She did the laundry. She did the dishes. She cleaned every day. She gardened. Very, very active on her feet person. Can you describe the, the importance of physical activity? Exercise is only a form of physical activity. There can be times, particularly on the weekends, that you, there, I mean, if you, you can go on uh, several websites, uh, whether you, know, you have to paint a room or do some work in the ground. There's a lot of yard work, raking. I mean, if you start yeah. looking at the physical activity you can do that's non-exercise all of that counts right absolutely in fact bill i think you've kind of hit on a really key point and this is something i like to emphasize to clients too is that the gym like we think of exercise and fitness we think of like a health club right or we think of our home gym i encourage people to reconceptualize how they view their traditional gym and that is it is a laboratory or a practice ground for functional movement yeah and the functional movements that we engage in in our lives every day the the yard work the laundry the you know the painting um you know painting our houses uh, you know whatever the uh the physical activity is mirrors movements that we have an opportunity to practice in the gym right if i'm doing a deadlift in the gym right picking up a weighted barbell up off the ground well what is that what is that functional pattern mirror picking up a heavy laundry basket right if i'm doing heavy farmers carries with a dumbbell in each hand and i'm i'm pacing across the gym what does that look like it looks like carrying heavy grocery bags yeah home from the supermarket, right? If I'm lifting something and putting it up overhead, like a dumbbell or a barbell, what does that look like, right? It looks like putting away an appliance in the highest cabinet in my kitchen, right? If I'm uh, doing squats in the gym, what does that look like? It looks like getting up and down off the sofa, 
right? So these functional movements in our lives, we have an opportunity to practice good movement habits and muscle recruitment in the gym. So I encourage people think of the gym not as just the place you go to burn a bunch of calories, but it's the place you go to practice good movement patterns. And you can do it with resistance or under load because we have weights there, dumbbells, barbells, etc., kettlebells. We can practice these basic human movement patterns, hip hinges, right? Squats, overhead presses, vertical presses, pulling movements, all of these movement patterns that we can apply to accomplishing uh, our daily tasks, home chores, et cetera, um, throughout the rest of our day. So think of the gym not as the goal or the place, but rather the practice ground so that you can get better at the movements that you apply throughout the rest of your day. That's, that, is, that is awesome. Now you can't see it, but right behind this camera, is a dumbbell rack <laughs> that goes from six pounds all the way to uh, 65 pounds. And that's in my home office. However, I tell all my clients, cause they're like, how do you st stay in such good shape? I mean, I have this, I mean, between phone calls, I'll go, I'll go, you know, crank out a set of curls, or whatever, but I got, I, so this, this exercise band, by the way, I got a little 30 pounder right here. I have this on me everywhere I go. If it's in my bag, everywhere I go. And between Zoom calls or phone calls, what I can do with this band is really incredible. So even if I, if I know, you know what, boy, I got a lot of Zoom today. This is going to be tough. It's a lot of desk time. I have this, I have those, and I'm not saying to put a, 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 a rack of dumbbells in your, in your, in your office at the, but you can, those bands are very, very effective. You go to your local sporting goods store and they, I think they start at five pounds and they go all the way over here, I have on my door all the way to 100 pounds. And you can do a lot of stuff with those bands, even in a busy office environment. And a lot of people just don't know about that. So I hope you're a big proponent of the bands when the gym's not available. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. There, and you can travel with them. Mm. Um, you know, even, even the smallest yeah. dumbbell, of course, is going to weigh your luggage down. Yes. So, but you, you start traveling with resistance bands. Um, those things are a great portable exercise tool. Absolutely. Excellent. All right. So let's wrap this up. So if somebody wants to now, are you, do you just work in, in your geographical area? Is that pretty much how you do it? So these days I see clients exclusively over Zoom, actually. Oh, so, uh, so I'm certainly not limited to the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and the focus has been on uh, corrective exercise. So I'm doing Excellent. working uh, with clients less in traditional exercise programs, you know, the push-up, push-ups, pull-ups, squats, uh, you know, barbell work, dumbbell work, et cetera. And I've shifted the focus of my work um, to corrective exercise, and which uh, is uh, a mobility routine that addresses kind of the problems that we were talking about uh, kind of at the top of the show here. Um, so as to address these muscle imbalances, these movement compensations, these poor static and dynamic postures. And the great thing about that uh, type of programming and type of work with clients is it lends itself perfectly to Zoom and in-home environment. You notice that I'm coming to you, uh, my couch is in the background, uh, the clients that I'm working with, they're in a, a similar you know, limited space in their living room, um, but that is actually an ideal environment in which yeah. to develop and maintain a mobility practice, right? Is, yeah. is because it's accessible, right? I don't have to, to, to sell a client on, oh, in order to, uh, to do this mobility routine, you also have to go out and get a gym membership, right? Because then mm -hmm. they're thinking, well, now there are all these obstacles in my yeah. way because I have to, uh, am I going to go to the gym before work or after work? Or am I going to come home first, but then I have to get in my car or, or you know, drive to the gym here? I can show you that this, you know, your living room is accessible to you and that makes your mobility routine and practice more accessible to you. Yeah. And I bet, um, and I'm assuming this is part of your service that you provide is that when a, an attorney calls you and wants to get started, I'm assuming you're going to probably take that. Uh, you're going to ask a lot of questions about their particular situation and really customize the program to them. Correct. Absolutely. Absolutely. The first thing I do is uh, obviously consult your doctor. Yes, <laughs> That's not only course. 
That's yeah. not only the lawyer in me, um, yeah. with the disclaimer, right? Um, but it, it also underlines the point that, you know, uh, uh, your doctor is going to be more familiar with um, your physical limitations, which of course I, I always ask client about prior injuries. Um, I ask them about, um, you know, if they have any uh, chronic or nagging pain now. And then we start to do um, uh, sort of movement assessments uh, about, you know, well, what could be kind of, we kind of trace back what could be the cause of that pain. Um, a telltale uh, is all, or rather a, um, you know, often clients will come to me and say, well, you know, my, my knee hurts, you know, I'm having some knee pain. And they might think that, you know, well, okay, the knee hurts. So therefore the, the knee must be where the problem is. There must be some dysfunction with the knee. And that's rarely the case. Um, usually the problems are upstream in the kinetic chain or downstream or sometimes both from where the chronic pain is. And the chronic pain is really just actually an indicator of a compensation that is no longer working. Right. So we start I start to do these movement assessments, find out where the individual um, is kind of having has, has adopted maybe a compensation or has a, uh, has developed a muscle imbalance uh, or some less than optimal motor pattern. Uh, and then we will start to address through um, uh, things like foam rolling, stretching, muscle activation. Uh, we start to address their unique uh, mobility limitations and needs. I think that's great. Because again, back to, we all start, we started on this topic. Attorneys don't have a lot of time. So I think by contacting you, all that's, they'd be, they'd be, they'd be, they'd be on online looking up research and just blowing a lot of time trying to figure this out when they could just call you. So for our attorney uh, audience, uh, Brian, how do they get a hold of you? I see your, your website is lawandmotion.com, lawandmotion.com. Is your contact information on the website? Is that the best way to get a hold of you? It sure is. Uh, you can also reach me at lawandmotionfitness at gmail.com. Uh, so that's a reliable email. But of course, lawandmotion.com, uh, that's my website. Uh, you can click to contact me there. Um, yes. Out, outstanding. Brian, thank you so much for being uh, on the podcast. I definitely want you back on because I think things, particularly as we come out of COVID, and I think we're going to get some great feedback on this. There may be some certain aspect that we may want to focus on uh, next time, but certainly want to have you back on because I really think um, particularly for attorneys and the trial attorneys I work on them, I think a healthy, active attorney is a better attorney. And uh, again, thank you so much for your time. Bill, thank you so much for having me on here. It's a pleasure to talk to you. It's a pleasure to, uh, to talk to your audience. Outstanding. And for our audience, thank you so much for participating in this edition of the Litigation Psychology Podcast. We will see you next time.